It's kind of like asking the Holy Spirit to give you eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to obey, right? So who's in front of you? What are you drawn to? Yeah. You know, yeah, like what's... can be a little bit about what you like. Yeah, too. sure. Because if you feel drawn to like street entrenched kids, <laughs> then maybe you want to find out from the local social services office what the felt needs are. We talked about right. that another time, right? Okay. And just show up and be present. But it ultimately, it's going to be about relationship. It's going to be simple and humble, not super and noble. Welcome to Down to Earth. I'm Jessica DeSabatino. And I'm Joyce Reese. And this is a show where we want to be real about God, the scriptures, and how we live our Christian faith out in real time, honoring God and shaping our culture and community around us. We dialogue about the purpose of vocational artists, social justice, generational transformation, why we bother with church, and a whole lot more. We're Joyce and Jess, and we're friends, pastors, and speakers. We thought perhaps we could work on this project together and have a little fun. Our goal is to talk about things we have passion for, connect with others about what matters to them, and together impact our world and honor God. Well, we want to talk today about justice again, partly because I think this is such a big topic, we couldn't cover it in just one week. And I also think it's a topic that is more about the heart than the head. I think we all know on some level that God's call is for us to be kind to the marginalized, and not just to be kind, but to do justice. But knowing that in our head, and then knowing it in our heart are two completely different things, and then actually doing something about it, and not just knowing about it, are worlds apart in some ways. And I think um, we've covered this a little bit in the previous episodes. This would be the third one on justice, but we've tried to address the fact that we sometimes live with a when-then mentality or the idea that somebody else has got it more than me. So, you know, I'll support them or I'll bless them or I'll encourage that or thank goodness we've got some good people like that in our church instead of every believer, every single person who says they follow Jesus has some necessity to worship the Lord by how we care for those who are most marginalized in society. Yeah, and I think, at least for me, Joyce, when I go out and talk about things like this in group contexts, I will often have people say, yeah, well, you're you're kind of just like fearless. You don't mind. I remember a number of years ago in Toronto, it was called the Summer of the Gun, and it was just a, a summer where there were tons of young people being shot. And Dave and I did all these crazy funerals for young kids. So sad, really sad. And some of the funerals were quite really heavy gang presence, really heavy police presence. If you've never done or been to a funeral with heavy police presence, it is something. Many people would say to me, well, I just don't have that. I'm fearful. And I think we use fear as an excuse a lot of times that stops us from actually doing what God has called us to do. And I think it's a real lie of the enemy. I think he wants nothing more than to make us uh, disabled from engaging. It's a valid point. And I think sometimes we haven't realized as well that it is like it is a call to worship. Like we think of worship as like stand up, sit down, sing songs, two clap songs, on a... Yeah, two, two slow songs. <laughs> um, An offering. If you've got a really happen in church, they will think of offering us worship too. Right. A bunch of years ago, there was a really interesting that unfolded in Vancouver. So there's a, a great church there. Some of you might have read or followed some of the stuff Ken Shigematsu does at 10th Avenue Alliance. And their whole community, he's the senior pastor, but the whole community is quite vibrant and engaged in the city. And so a few years back, it's got to be 12 maybe or so, I don't know, a while ago. But they decided to do a renovation on their building. If you know Vancouver at all, they're just off of Main Street, kind of up from Kingsway, just a little south on 10th Avenue and beautiful building, really nice neighborhood, old heritage houses that are worth a lot of money. Anyway, for years before this, they'd been running a thing called In From the Cold and doing an evening dinner and then letting people sleep in their building that were street entrenched. But when the (laughs) renos happened, instead of the lineup being in the alley, the lineup had to be through the front door on a, I think, Tuesday night or whatever night it was they were doing. All of a sudden, the neighbors saw 
all these street entrenched people going into 10th Avenue Alliance Church and they freaked out. They had what we call a NIMBY mentality and not in my backyard. This is going to devalue our properties. They went ballistic and they said, you can't run this. You don't have a permit to operate as a social service center. And they took it all the way to City Hall to try to stop the in from the cold happening at 10th Avenue Alliance. Well, 10th's response was really, really interesting. My friend Julie was on staff there at that time, and so I kind of tracked with what was happening. But they banded together with a synagogue in the city and a mosque. And the three groups went to City Hall and advocated that basically if they were If this was removed from tents, the permission to feed the poor and to have them sleep in their building, then they knew it was a slippery slope. Pretty soon the mosque wouldn't be allowed to do that, and also the synagogue wouldn't be allowed to do that. And so these three groups raised their voice together on behalf of marginalized people and said, this is a mandated act of worship in the scriptures. This is what it means to worship God. And they pointed to passages like Isaiah 58 and different texts that said, like, this is how we practice our worship. And you know what? They won. And I just thought, wow, that was really amazing. It was a whole group effort, you know, and it was institutional or corporate, if you want to call it that, in terms of their articulation. But they understood something that's true for every single believer. I remember people reacting to that later, thinking how profound it was, but also that they had no idea that this is an act of worship. Right. This idea that somehow it's just an optional part, like if you're an uber Christian right. or you kind of have leanings to become a missionary, because right. we all know that missionaries are more spiritual, yeah. then maybe you would do something like that. Yeah. I, I think though, Joyce, and I think what we want to talk about is, so, okay, so you're listening to this podcast and you say, yeah, I want to do something. Bye, so like... <laughs> That's nice, but how and what do I do? Yeah, how, well, I think part of it is how do you get relationship first? Right. Right, like, seems so basic, but, like, how do you find relationship with people who are marginalized? Right. Yeah, and I think part of that is just that you have to acknowledge that you have to find it. I can remember when I was in university, in, in my second year of university, and I had moved to Minneapolis, and I was living there and I decided oh I would maybe get involved in a church and this is in the 90s when people still had tent crusades do you remember those oh Oh, you might remember tent crusades I hated tent crusades well my pastor decided we were going to have a tent crusade we were to go out and like hand out invitations for the tent crusade you might want to explain okay a tent yeah if you don't know what a tent crusade is let me explain okay okay so not not in the historical sense (laughs) of crusades it's sort of like a circus tent, usually on a mall parking lot in a very conspicuous area. If you were a teenager and your parents made you go to this, the worst, because usually it was like right by the best stores. They'd put a big tent and then they'd have really kind of, I don't know. Worship? Well, it's kind of mean. I don't if know you're if listening I ever, to this, I don't think I've ever been to one. sometimes they put sawdust down on the ground. I don't know if that was to make it seem more 1950s, but... They did. And they put chairs in there and it was always blistering hot when you'd go in this circus tent. And then they'd have some special preacher. And basically the point of it is that that people would come to Jesus. You'd put a church, a portable church, in a very visible place. And we don't do those so much anymore. But in the kind of goes back to revivalism, right? Right. In the eighteen hundreds. Right. Yeah. Circuit riding preachers and all that. Exactly. So my my pastor decided we were gonna have a tent crusade. In Minneapolis. Right. So we had to take all these invitations and hand them out. Now I am one of the most shy people in the world. I am not lying to tell you that when I got first got married I still could not call Domino's Pizza for pizza delivery. Like (laughs) I have a phobia of I and I had and I mean God is working on me but I had a massive phobia of talking to people I didn't know I was really worried as a young pastor that I'd run out of things to talk to people about so I'd keep five questions in my back pocket in case I ran out so she asked us we had to go out and like talk to strangers and invite strangers this was like the worst worst. so I thought to myself I was gonna you know ask a few people then I was gonna put go into a few stores and put like stacks of by the counter yeah exactly because then you could get rid of like 50 or 100 at once (laughs) But I had a friend that was with me, and he was like, 
crazy like evangelist guy and he always started every conversation he had with you with this statement are you loving jesus like crazy people he didn't know people that didn't know jesus he was just like wow uh, he'd been a drug addict and god had delivered him from a bunch of stuff so he's very excited to be a christian so this is this is like we've been given it for him he is my partner in this endeavor and we have been given a gift we are going to go onto the streets of minneapolis right. he has what i call extreme new christian syndrome no he was not a new christian I know, he's like 50 years now. old and okay. still the same way yeah so he is like very excitable and i am not i am like the anti-excitable okay. so i'm walking and and he sees so we've been at this for a little while and i am sweating because i'm talking to all kinds of people i don't know and my my introversion is becoming very exaggerated yes i need to go home and read a book or something <laughs> okay. So I'm getting to the end of my thing, and then in a the distance we see this lady coming, and she is definitely on crack. She's definitely a crack addict, but she has five kids with her. And Joyce, I thought to myself as I looked at her, this will be great. I only have like 10 invitations left. I can give one to all the kids, and I can probably give her two or three. So my friend Wayne goes up to her and says, hey, you loving Jesus? Would you like to come to this 10 crusade? And I'm just like, whatever here everybody take an invitation you can come she's clearly jonesing like this is a nightmare she's not even coherent at all her son her middle son had catatonic epilepsy and so in that moment he had gone into uh oh boy yeah seizure yeah so i mean it was a sort of innocuous conversation and then we left and i thought to myself and he was going after her like and i was like this is ridiculous because she's on drugs and she's not listening to you and so we get to the tent crusade and couple days later and we're in the worship and then it kind of got really quiet in between where someone comes and then I could hear bags rustling you know in church when you move around you can always hear like candies opening well I could hear these bags rustling and I turn around and there's this lady that we had talked to with her five kids coming through the door well now all of a sudden I got all kinds of faith because of course this was somebody I invited to this tent crusade and here she is really yes I'm right? like all of a sudden a great woman of faith so <laughs> then anyways she sits in the thing and our, our pastor gets up and preaches and calls people to make a decision for Jesus well this lady is the first person down at the altar well I decide since I invited her that I should be the first one to get right. down there yeah yeah so I'm getting down there as like a big woman of faith and she says to me first thing down she said I, I'm making this decision but the thing is I, I feel like God saying to me right now that someday someday soon I'm gonna be like the lady up on the stage that like was speaking and I'm, I'm gonna do that for youth though for the youths and I said all right <laughs> okay you got five kids so you already got your own built-in youth group all right <laughs> and uh, I didn't know anything about her at this time I didn't know that some of the kids that were with her were her sister's kids that she had taken in and I was a 20 year old kid wet behind the ears and I knew in that moment that what I was to do is just build friendship with this lady it wasn't because I I didn't know anything about her I knew she was probably a really marginalized lady she was probably like five foot three and 75 pounds soaking wet like really yeah. tiny tiny lady and obviously had a severe addiction yeah so anyways i prayed with her that day and then I, I got her number and i started going over to her house and it was as simple as this like i couldn't i had no money because i was a student i had not really a lot of time because i was a student although can but i, I had to say students always think they don't have any time but I was gonna say but I did have some time I had time when I was studying I just say to her hey Trish I'm just gonna come over and I'll bring macaroni and we'll make macaroni and I'll study and I'll just hang out with your kids and help them do their homework and so this went on for about a year I'd help the kids with their homework and just hang out yeah. with Trish and every time I saw her Joyce she would say I just feel like and now she's getting lingo a little bit I feel like I, I'm called to be a pastor and I think have you even graduated? Well, I went to the eighth grade. So I said, okay, let's, let's see if we can get you a GED. So every day that I'd go over and do my homework, wow. Trish would be doing her score. And she had all these kids with all these problems. Nobody in their family had ever graduated from college. Nobody, gangbangers used to come and use her house as a drive-by shooting place. They'd come into the house, use her, and they'd pay her. They'd use her kitchen window as a way to, because it was, it was 
So when she first came to Jesus, things started changing. And she, the first, the very first, one of the first weeks I was there, she had made her own little sign, no gangbangers welcome here anymore. And she just stuck it on the outside of her door. So in the middle of this, God started, you know, you could see the kingdom of God working in her life. Mm. I began helping her kids a little bit. And I, I just began saying to her, like, Trish, the best way that you can continue to show the love of God in your life is to raise your children to know Jesus. And so we talked about how that would be on a very practical level. I, w- I was training to be a teacher, so I was helping these kids with math and helping them with spelling and telling them that they had to get ready for school and, and that they couldn't miss three out of five days, which was the case for sure. many of the kids in the inner yeah. city, right? you got to go every day. And I subsequently, and you know, this went on, we just continued our friendship for the number of months that I was living there, and I, I had to go home for a family emergency. I actually ended up never going back to Minneapolis. And well, I'd keep in touch a little bit with Trish through a lot of my friends. And a couple years later, one of my friends said, oh, hey, have you heard from Trish lately? And I said, no, this is before the advent of Facebook, before you could follow everybody's life, what everybody eats, (laughs) where they go. Yes. So you just kind of lose touch with people. Well, the long and short of the story is my friend Trish had not only completed her GED, but she had gone on to complete Bible college. And she moved her whole entire family to the Robert Taylor Projects where they started a youth ministry there with hundreds of kids in it. She went on to get her master's and last week, last week, her youngest son, Corbin, graduated from college, one of the first in his family to do it, on a full ride scholarship for violin. He will play violin in in the Chicago, yeah. He's played for Barack Obama, he's played for all kinds of people. That's so Um, awesome. that story, I mean, that story is a story about the power of God working in people's lives. But I'm sure glad that I got a front row seat to that story. Because anytime I get to thinking like, I don't know, I can't do I, it. It's God that works anyways. It's just us that comes alongside of him and gets to watch these stories. And so we we become people who engage in justice issues, not for what we can do or for what we can offer, but it's because it changes us from the inside out. Right. And the fact of the matter is it's an act of worship. So you didn't know the end game of that story. No. I mean, it could have been turned out terrible. Right. But you just knew reach for relationship. Reach for relationship. Eat macaroni with people. Show up. Help them with the basics. Homework, brush teeth, go to school every day. Yeah. Just even being present to a single mom in a small context, small way, is gift for a mom's sanity. Right. And I think we often want to change the whole world. I mean, I had quite a bit of guilt when I left and I left this sort of relationship. But I'm really thankful that the God we serve is not a God that says, you got to have everything, all your T's crossed and your I's dotted before right. you do something. And she was obviously connected to more than just you, right? Yeah, like absolutely. there's a community. I always say, look, uh, when we reach for a relationship, we do it in the context of community. Yeah. I remember in the downtown east side, it was we'd been you know, around for a few years and then we got invited to some kind of community group. And, and they said, oh, you guys are from what group? And we're like Jacob's Well. And they started finding out a bit about us and realized we weren't like a cult. But they somehow had thought we were because they saw us always going everywhere in pairs. So they thought we were like two by twos. Back in the day, they would go out and do like a proselytizing kind of mission work. Mm -hmm. But in pairs always and super conservative and kind of odd, at least at that time. And so these people in the neighborhood thought we were them, right? And we were like, no, we just realized we should go together. It's better. It's safer one. But add to that, like, somebody graduates university and leaves Vancouver, or in your case, you went, you know, back from Minneapolis to Toronto. (coughs) What happens to the relationship if you move on? Well, in our context, the gift was nothing because they still had all these other friends, right? And so they belong to the community, not the community of faith, not just to one individual Christian. And Right. And I think the thing is, when we're talking about justice, we have to frame it properly. God has not called you to be the Messiah. Right. And I think we know this from experience that sometimes when people really lean into justice issues, they confuse that with themselves having a Messiah complex. Like I'm called to save the world. And what I'm acutely aware of is that God doesn't actually call us to save the world. He already did that. What we're called to just do is to lean into where he's working. And in some ways it's for us more than anything. We get to see him at work in really powerful ways because the word of God is really clear that he's close to the brokenhearted. So if we want to be close to God, we should lean into the brokenhearted because that's where he is. Yep. 
Absolutely. So it's it's both end, right? It's revelation to us and it's encounter for them. Yep. And then it's like you described very well with this story about Trish and her family. Then good news came through them, not just to them, right? We right. talked about that a few weeks ago. Right. So it's not a condescension. Right. It is a, we get to see the power of God at work in people's lives, working right. through their lives. Yeah, it's really, really important. I think, so just in the beginning steps of finding that relationship, finding friendship, you got to follow the threads, right? So you saw her come in to that crusade meeting that you didn't even really have much faith for. And you just thought, well, I invited her, so I should, right. you know, reach for relationship. It's that simple. Like people say to me, oh, I don't know how. I was like, okay, you go to the same bus stop every day. You pass the same homeless guy sitting there with his hand out. That's your guy. Yeah. Right? Like, that's your guy. You just got to start to know him. Like, people say, well, I don't know how to get relationship. Well, you start by making some appropriate eye contact. There is inappropriate eye contact in street culture, and you got to, like, learn those things. And you might have to learn the hard way because somebody might lose their mind on you, like, shout expletives and get up in your face. Particularly for street-entrenched women, any street workers, you don't want to, like you know, sort of stare at them or give them a lot of eye contact because that is offensive to them. Sort of a challenge, like a throwdown. But start. When you walk your dog and you pass the same elderly street entrenched Chinese lady who's binning in the the garbage bins looking for empties, like, say hello. Yeah. She might not even speak very much English, but smile. Like just very basic social skills. And in time, you might start to realize, I see the same lady or I see the same homeless man or I see the same single mom all the time who struggles with her kids or, and then begin to reach gently for relationship. Yeah. And part of it might be just somebody, it might be as simple as somebody who sits next to you at church every week right. and, and you, you just have to ask for people's story. Yeah, There's all kinds of people with all kinds of stories that you can really lean into and, yeah. and help. It's kind of like asking the Holy Spirit to give you eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart yeah. to obey, right? So, who's in front of you? What are you drawn to? Yeah. You know, yeah, like this what's... This can be a little bit about what you like. Yeah, too. sure. Because if you feel drawn to like street entrenched kids, <laughs> then maybe you want to find out from the local social services office what the felt needs are. We talked about right. that another time, right? Yeah. And may maybe it's you feel a... A call to help a refugee family. Right. And so you organize that and yeah. get a refugee family and help them. And just show up and be present. But it, ultimately, it's going to be about relationship. It's going to be simple and humble, not super and noble. And you right. got to get that in your head at the beginning. Because otherwise, you know, you've been visiting them for two weeks and there's been no bomb dropping transformation. So then you want to bail. Or it's awkward. Imagine it's awkward, or right? boring. Yeah. A bunch of years ago, we, um, I had a friend, uh, Faitine Kreisko, some people in Canada might know her, but she was moving from Canada to Liberia, I think, at the time. And she'd been running just like a grocery program for people who needed to access the food bank but had disabilities and couldn't get there. And so she just organized a bunch of people to go and bring the groceries to the people. And so we just signed up to do that. And she said, look, I've got to go. I'm going, you know, to Africa. And so I'm wondering, I can't get any church people to go to the downtown east side to do these deliveries because they're so scared, which kind of made us laugh because it's not that scary. But anyway, she said, I've got these nine people. Can you do the, do them all? And so I was like, yep, we'll do them all. So we started like Friday became food delivery day. And I remember going to this guy Mario's house and he lived in a community um, co-op building and it was hard to get in. And then we we went upstairs and... He said, I'm not in my apartment. I'm at my friend's apartment, so come here. So we went to Nick's apartment. And he just kind of cracked the door and took the bags, and that was it, shut the door again. And it took months before he would actually have three-minute conversation on a Friday. And then eventually we found out why he was at Nick's and not upstairs in his <coughs> own apartment. because he had hoarding issues, and he actually couldn't get into his room, his apartment anymore. And he started to trust us just because we kept showing up with food. And then he said, you know, would would you ever be willing to come in and look at it and just tell me, like, how I could deal with this problem? 
long story short, you know, it took us a couple of years, but we would set up teams on Fridays and we would bring him his groceries and then we'd go work for a little bit in his apartment. And, and he did a ton of work himself and he recovered all his space, his entire apartment. He was able to live in at first, cleared enough space he could sleep on his couch. And then we worked on his kitchen so he could cook there and then in his living room. And then, and you know what, in the end, I mean, he died few years ago, but in the end, he said to us, you know, I was excommunicated from the Jehovah's Witnesses for some stuff and that they didn't agree with in his life. But he said, I finally understand who Jesus is, and I finally understand what it means to follow him, and I finally know what this looks like because of this community. And every year for, I don't know, probably the last six, seven years of his life, he threw a party for our whole community because at the co-op, they had a rooftop garden. And beautiful tables and a beautiful city view. And you could see the water down by Crab Park and all the seaplanes coming and landing, cruise ships going in and out of the Broad Inlet. And he would invite us up there and we would bring food. We'd have a huge potluck and he would make us tortier. He was French Canadian. And this became a wonderful celebration. Like one of our best celebrations as a community came from the guy who wouldn't even open the door for us. Right got totally folded in and belonged to Jesus. But it was such a slow process. So simple and humble, never super and noble. Yeah, and I think the idea that we just remember that nobody has the same story as us, so their lives aren't the same as ours. I think we often look for conformity, right? So, So you had a life where you were able to pull yourself up by the bootstraps. And so we expect other people to do that too. And we just remember... not everybody is like us. Nobody has the same story. So there's there's an element of patience, too. Yeah. And the gift of listening, yeah. which, frankly, I'm not that good at, but I try to keep growing in. But, you know, you learn when you've been around anybody who's marginalized that they've, they've all had trauma. They've all right. got pain. Yeah. And trust takes a really, really long time to build. I always say to people, look, think four or five times longer than you expect. Trust would be in a, a deep friendship you would have with a peer. This is, if someone suffered a lot of trauma, it's going to take way, way longer. So adjust your expectations, right? Yeah. And even your expectations around what friendship looks like. Like we talk about Jesus was a friend of sinners, right? Doesn't say he was a friend to sinners. Yeah. Like if uh, somebody said to you, you know, do you know so-and-so? And, and you said, oh yeah, I know her. I'm a friend to her. Like right away, you just hear that's condescending. You wouldn't say that, Jess. I know that about you, but... Maybe. <laughs> But, you know, you go, you're a friend to her? Like, what does that mean? No, we wouldn't say that. We say, oh, yeah, I'm a friend of hers, right? And there's all of a sudden some kind of mutual reciprocity embedded in it. But I think when people hear that, oh, yeah, we're a friend of, right, that it's got mutuality in it, then we expect, like, bestie, right? right? And, like, let's be candid. My friendship with my husband is, it's a significant friendship. It's my most significant friendship. Callum's my best and closest heart friend, my companion, but it's different, right, than my friendship with you, Jess. Mm-hmm. Or our friendship is different than, say, my friendship with Heidi, who's a part of my community and I've only known for a couple of years, but she's one of our elders and, you know, significant leader, young leader in our community. So my friendship with her will look different again. My friendship with my next-door neighbors looks different. So I think sometimes we hear that word and we think it has to equal most intimate Right. Most mutual, most deeply heart connected. Well, but and then we're disillusioned when it is not. Right. Or we're trying to force them into some category of belonging with us that they don't even want. Right. So just show up in the ways that they want, you know? And in the ways that work for you as well. Yeah. So a little bit, I think there's two sides of ditch to every truth. So the truth is, I mean, I think we have to show up. And I think people, though, if you're not careful, you can either go to one side or the other, you don't show up at all, or you show up so much that it encompasses your whole life, so it's not sustainable. And could kind of freak them out or create codependency. And I think that's something that, you know, we actually have to be cautious about, just not wanting to set people up for alienation because we set something up that's unsustainable. Right. And then, then they have nothing, right? The bottom comes out. or Yeah, and I think that when you're talking about justice issues, the best thing is to Undercommit and over deliver. I remember somebody saying that to me when I first started working with people in the inner city. Mm-hmm. Undercommit and over deliver. Right. Don't tell some kid you're going to be at every single game of theirs, every single basketball game, and then you have to pull back and say, "Oh, sorry, I can only come to one." All right. So undercommit and over deliver. It's the really best good way to advice. be. Yeah, it's really, really good advice. And I think 
you know, then you can sort of baby step your way. Like we always talk about, you know, like the what about Bob, like just little, little bit incremental. Take someone with you. Early days in the downtown east side, we didn't have that practice of always going somewhere with someone. So I would walk around with Pauline. That was my earliest orientation. You know, the old lady that founded our community when she was 85. Miraculous woman. Listen to an earlier episode and you'll hear a bit about her. You know, there came a time when uh, I was out doing things by myself, doing food delivery or visiting someone or walking the streets or in the pubs. And then I had a horrible experience one day. I brought my friend Bethany with me. Just She'd never been in the neighborhood and wanted to learn a bit about what I was doing. We were in seminary together at Regent College. And so she came with me for an afternoon. And it's a long story. There was a man who had been assaulted by his girlfriend, actually. And he was hunched down on the sidewalk and he was bleeding from his head. And I knew them and I knew that there is a volatile relationship there. So I just went over to see if he needed any medical treatment and was he okay. And the girlfriend had walked, I don't know, 30, 40 feet down the block in a rage. And then she saw me crouch down beside him, just seeing if he was okay. And she lost it on me. In the end, she threw a big container of hot soup in my face Mm. and burned my neck and my face. And anyway, all the soup through my dreads. And I was scared. Like, I actually was scared. And a young man stepped in between us. He was 22 years old, didn't know me, didn't know her. He just stepped in between and became a physical presence. And I kept backing up the block and he kept backing up with me. And somehow she stood down and didn't, you know, kill me or some weird thing that day. We're glad you didn't die. Yeah, and so anyway, that young guy, he said, look, um, do you want to come into my apartment? I live in this building and get cleaned up. And I was kind of nervous of that, but I didn't really have a lot of other options. And he had towels, and I had Bethany with me, so I thought, okay. So we went in upstairs, I think 10th floor or something. We went into this little apartment, and he got some towels for me. He was just just a young man who would obviously kind of, been in a hard place and was trying to find his way out and he was he was finding his way out and he he gave me stuff to clean up and I was trying to deal with the burns he said to me you know I shouldn't walk around alone something worse could happen than this and I thought what an odd thing to say like I wasn't alone today and he could obviously see that and I said I wasn't alone he said no but you walk around alone all the time everybody knows that and I said what and he said uh yeah like those guys down by the Funky Winkler, they're going to rape you the next time you come along by yourself. And I blanched like I was burned. And so that part of my body stayed red, but the rest of me just went white as a sheet. And I really got scared. I said, how do you know that? He said, it's, ta- it's being talked about on the street. Some people with religious convictions say you can't do that. That would be like raping a nun. And other people think it's like funny. He's like, they're serious about it. Don't go down there by yourself. So, of course, you know, you can imagine how that kind of threw me for a loop. I was under one year in a street-entrenched neighborhood every day with people that I'd, like, come to not be afraid of. And now I'm being told, and I'm being stricken, actually, with fear, being told to be afraid, to stay safe. And I went away for a week. I went and stayed in a cabin. Some pastor friends of mine, you probably know them, Dave and Pat Ball, gave me their place up on the Sunshine Coast and I went and stayed there with a few girlfriends and I cried a lot and I walked in the woods and I prayed and I thought, I don't know if I can go back. It wasn't because that woman had traumatized me so badly and because I got burned, it was because of the threat of this other worst thing that could happen. And I remember going for a walk with Pauline and asking her when I came back at the end of that week what she thought, okay? So she was like 85 and had been in the neighborhood for 25 years and she said, you know, dear, because I said I have actually had a like a gross feeling every time I've been down there near those guys when we walk past. And she said, you have to remember there's a difference between fear and discernment. And she said, God hasn't given you a fear to spear, uh, a fear to spear. <laughs> that was awesome. God hasn't given you a spirit of fear, but he's given you a gift of discernment. And you must heed that. You must listen. And so instead of being like all bravado and like, I'm not going to back down, you actually have to listen to the Spirit of God giving you discernment. Don't go near those guys. So I went back to the drawing board and I asked the Lord, what would it look like if I continued? And He just said to me, you can continue. You just don't go anywhere alone. 
There's safety in numbers. It was just simple wisdom. Right. And after that, we did everything together. And Like, did it slow relationship down? Yeah, it did a little bit, right? Because somebody would maybe be more vulnerable if I was with them by myself than I brought my friend along and they don't really know their friend as well as they know me. But you know what? I was up for the slower as long as it was safer. Right. And so it's putting those two things together. Yeah. And I think you bring up a really good point that sometimes there's going to be rejection. Right. That justice doesn't always turn out to be a Nikki Cruz story. Right. Or it doesn't. I, right. There, there, there are rejections, and there, there will be personal rejection. And loss and suffering. Right. You Absolutely. can't sign on for this. Like I used to say to people, we would newly orient to uh, being a part of living in our downtown Eastside community. And I'd be like, okay, so, you know, tell me about your plan. What's going to happen when you get robbed for the first time? Right. And they were like, what? I was like, well, if you're going to live here, you're going to get robbed. Factoid. So we need to think carefully about like where you keep your passport in your room and, you know, this kind of stuff. Like we got robbed. We got robbed so bad one time, Jess. I don't know if you know this story, but I came home and my apartment door was open, blowing in the wind. And I was like, hello, and discovered we'd been robbed. And I thought, oh, my goodness, they never found my bedroom or they were too scared to go up to the loft. But like Rachel and Katie got cleaned out, cameras, and Katie was a photographer, so that was a big deal. Laptop, computers, passports, everything. And so we were really upset. We had all our boyfriends come and sleep there that night because the locks couldn't get changed for like 48 hours or something. We couldn't get a locksmith to come. And we were scared because we noticed that the spare keys were gone. So the next day, the locksmith was going to be there around 5.30 p.m. So we thought, okay, well, that's fine. Nope. You know what those guys did? They came back and robbed us a second time, used the keys to come in during the day because uh, the locks hadn't been changed yet. And then they cleaned out my room. Oh, I was mad as a hatter. Excited to leave to go to Europe to teach. Like, And all my teaching was on the computer. So we went out on the street and I called in every favor I had. I was like, come on, somebody knows where my stuff is. I didn't get the computer back. Somebody tried. You know, they said, look, we know where it is and they want $300. And I was like, that ain't never going to happen. Don't you understand how poor I am? And that computer got given to us because we were poor, you know. But it was stressful. If you're not prepared for some kind of loss and consequence, the yeah. the year the Volvo, my you remember my beat up old Volvo? The year the Volvo got broken into and all the Christmas presents that were in the trunk that had been given by like suburban church people for some of our street entrenched friends got stolen. Oh, I was so angry. Yeah. I mean, so you have to prepare yourself for that, that you are going to have, and on some level, you're going to have some personal rejection too. People who you try to be kind to, and they, they can't accept your kindness, and they don't want your do gooderness. Right. And that's okay. You just, if you, if you prepare yourself for that, and learn from some of those yeah. things too, right? Because sometimes they're discerning things in us. You try too hard or you're noble me, needy them. They feel something plastic in your posture. Or yeah, and some of them you'll see great strides forward and then 400 steps backwards. Yeah. And I think the question that we, and I think this pushes us away from this kind of work in some ways because I think we think, oh, the disappointment is real. Yeah. But if we can learn to lean into the disappointment and be able to say, okay, something in this there's discomfort here, but there's beauty in this yeah. discomfort. Yeah. So one thing I wanted to just mention again, or just bring up is a lot of people don't realize how important it is to seek wisdom from people who've been, you know, doing the work for a long time, especially if you're a young adult and you're like coming new to the neighborhood or you're new to engaging your life with a certain population of people. Or I always go to my friend, Beth, she's not that much older than me, but all wisdom about anything to do with First Nations culture. She's taught me more than anybody I know in terms of how to be respectful and how to understand and how to speak and what the protocol is around bringing gifts and receiving gifts and like so many things that I would never have known. I would have stepped on toes left, right and center if I hadn't got her wisdom. So I think it's very, very important. I remember we got an intern from Regent. We had a lot of interns we trained through, through the years, but he was a guy who just thought he knew and he was actually my peer. He was around the same age as me, and we were in a similar program in school. But he did not have the experience I had. And so I just kept saying to him, like, you don't do anything alone, right? And he didn't really believe me, especially that he shouldn't do anything alone, even with, like, other staff in the neighborhood. So I just, like, there's safety, do things together. And you know what ended up happening is the 
social worker who worked upstairs in the hotel with many of our friends, she fell for him. And it got super awkward, and he was like, oh, I think I miscommunicated this and that, and I think she thinks I'm into her, and I'm not into her, and she doesn't know Jesus. And it's it was a huge, huge mess. He created very big problems for us because then her feelings were hurt, and she was alienated, and she didn't trust our community. And it created like a swirl around that drama that impacted the whole community, impacted our Right. relationships in the neighborhood so as you go into something like this the key is to stay humble you have to you don't have it all figured out right. maybe god's called you to start some kind of a ministry but learn from people who know better and go slow yeah i always think uh, it's mustard seed kingdom right incremental and tiny it can grow to something big but don't don't sit down at a computer and map out your brilliant idea for how you're going to change and start this enormous project to like transform this neighborhood in your community like because for people that have been there for a long time that's going to smack as really arrogant annoying, annoying to yeah them. and offensive yeah. it isn't to say don't be clever and be strategic and yeah and okay. don't have a it, and we're not saying don't have a vision get a vision but yeah sort of i think the scripture bears out that we would be people that would guard those visions you don't you don't need to tell people that and also I'm going to be the next mother Teresa and uh-huh. you don't exactly. you don't need to say things like that so just yeah. go and serve go and find somewhere to serve and maybe you live in suburbia as as a lot of us do who live and I mean we currently live in a city that is also known as a suburb a big giant suburb yeah. and so you're going to have to be creative but yeah. there's all kinds of need wherever you are there's people who are in need yeah. and God will show you. He yeah. will absolutely show up and show you exactly who it is that he wants you to impact and who it is that he wants you to be in relationship with. Yeah, and then if you keep that learning posture, yeah. it, it'll be amazing to you and to those around you what God will do yeah. through you and in you. Yeah, that's great. Okay, we'll talk a little more in the next episode about justice and just answer some of the questions we've most commonly received. Thanks for listening to another episode of Down to Earth. We hope you've enjoyed listening and feel inspired to grow in your relationship with God and to engage your life in ways that shape your culture and community. If you enjoyed today's episode, please take a moment and leave a review on iTunes. Not only does it let us know how we're doing, but it helps other people find the show. Remember, if you have any comments, questions, or feedback, please leave them in the comments on this episode at downtoearthpodcast.com.